Some will see him as a hero, some will see him as a demon. This is a man who came from a very poor background, turned out to have a talent that actually changed the face of the world. This mad dog of the Middle East has a goal of a world revolution. He wanted to be different. He wanted to appeal to the Arab masses. He was built up to be this great mad, mad menace in North Africa. Gaddafi is a revolutionary. A revolutionary probes with a sword until he encounters steel. During the Second World War, the rumble of tanks was heard again and again in the Libyan desert as Nazi tanks battled the British. Overhead, the drone of Nazi planes signaled that another round of bombs was about to be showered on North Africa. The sounds of war were the very earliest memories of Muammar Gaddafi, the leader of Libya and one of the most controversial men of our time. Gaddafi was born in the desert. He gives the year of his birth as 1942, but it may have been as early as 1940. He was born in a tent into a family of nomadic Bedouins. He was the youngest of Aisha and Abu Meniar's four children and the only boy. His parents were both largely illiterate Bedouin. His father was a uh, nomad and so moved around and, and camped according to the seasons and the needs of the livestock. And he traveled as a Bedouin child a great deal when he was little. Gaddafi was brought up in a strictly observant Muslim family rich in Islamic traditions but with no material comforts. Still, the freedom of Bedouin life proved fundamental to Gaddafi's outlook. By Bedouin, that means uh, the pure life of the man, uh, the straight thinking, the good doing. That we mean by Bedouin. Next to the magnificence of the ruins left in Libya by the Romans, the Bedouin lifestyle was primitive. Like their predecessors, the Italians wanted to colonize North Africa, and in 1911, they started the conquest of Libya. Soon after he came to power in 1922, Benito Mussolini imposed his fascist regime on Libya, and the Italians ruled with brutality until their defeat in the Second World War. In the course of 20 to 30 years, the Italians uh, sought to crush the life out of the Libyans. It was the Italians who set up the first concentration camps. Uh, there were huge concentration camps in Libya. They killed hundreds of thousands of Libyans in massacres and slaughters. They committed abominable atrocities, and the Italians used poison gas. But the Libyans fought back. The improbable leader of the resistance was an old school teacher, Omar Mukhtar. He roused his countrymen to stand up to the Italians, and he was Gaddafi's first great hero. In the long struggle against colonization, Gaddafi's grandfather was killed, and his father reportedly wounded. The bravery of the Libyans, and particularly Omar Mukhtar, became legend and was celebrated in a movie epic. Lion of the Desert, an epic story of courage and conquest. Murderer! Anthony Quinn is Omar Mukhtar, whose love for peace filled him with the power to fight. In 1931, the 80-year-old rebel leader was finally caught and executed. But the memory of Mukhtar and Italian rule was passed down in stories told to Gaddafi by his father. Omar Mukhtar was, was a great influence for Gaddafi, and uh, certainly at, at one stage in his career, in his political career, he often used to refer to Omar Mukhtar as a great symbol of rebellion against colonialism and of Libyan nationalism. So the sorts of things that Gaddafi heard and saw as a child were very much um, going to color what he would later think about Westerners in general. Many nomadic children never got an education, but Gaddafi's father sent him to school in Sirte on the Mediterranean coast when he was about nine years old. Like Muslim boys everywhere, he learned to read and recite the Quran. Too poor to rent a room, Gaddafi spent nights on the floor of the mosque. He would probably have been functionally illiterate if the family had not moved to this house in Seba, a town deep in the Sahara, 
where his father had gotten a job with a local tribal leader. Gaddafi was enrolled in Seba Secondary School around 1956, but even more important than his classes was the radio. It broadcast the speeches of Egypt's Gamal Abdel Nasser. Nasser preached Arab pride and unity. Gaddafi was enthralled, and even as a teenager, he knew Nasser's speeches by heart. Nasser would get on the radio and people could understand it. It wasn't formal, it wasn't French, it wasn't things that ordinary Arabs didn't understand. So part of his power was not only what he said, but how he said it. <laughs> Arabs could be independent, they could be proud of their heritage, they could stand up to imperialism. Nasser came like a titan on this stage, and every young Arab everywhere uh, looked on Nasser, known as the Rais, the boss, uh, as uh, the guiding light for them. He was, the, he was a thrilling man. As a high school student, Gaddafi was inflamed by Nasser's notion of Arab nationalism. He turned into a political activist and began to enlist his schoolmates in his cause. He uh, always catch any chance to uh, speak about uh, unity, about uh, Nasser, about uh, uh, liberation. He used to carry around this, this little stool uh, and um, in classroom and uh, outside, he would get up on his little stool and uh, he would talk to his students. It was the beginning of his political career. Since independence in 1951, Libya had been ruled by King Idris. His Highness of Said Mohammed Idris al Mahdi al Sanusi became King Idris I. The new nation is a poverty stricken land. Idris had been chosen by the British, but he was more interested in religion than government and ruled distractedly under Western guidance. He allowed Britain and the United States to rent bases in Libya, and these earned a bit of income for one of the poorest countries in the world. But in 1959, Libya's fortunes suddenly changed. Oil was discovered in the desert near where Gaddafi was born. The new wealth made a few Libyans exceedingly wealthy and left the rest as poor as they had always been. Because the king was not really paying much attention, much of that money also was dissipated in corruption. Um, and it was one of the principal complaints against the king that Gaddafi articulated, but it was very widespread. Everybody thought the regime was corrupt. In 1961, in Seba, at the age of 18, Gaddafi organized a demonstration against foreign bases on Libyan soil. They found that Colonel Gaddafi was behind this, but they don't they discover, uh, don't uh, uh, discover that this is movement. He was arrested, expelled, and had to finish high school elsewhere. And that convinced him that in order for him to have any change, he had to go through a different route. So in 1963, he went to Benghazi and managed to enroll at the military academy. There, he continued his political activities, which did not escape the notice of British officers. This particular British non-com uh, said that he was pathetic in everything he did. He was pathetic on the rifle range. He was pathetic at physical training. He was pathetic on the parade ground. I'm virtually quoting his, his words. But he was a very charismatic and effective uh, politician. He was leading resistance and not even hiding it. He was viewed as being sort of a quixotic uh, individual who really didn't represent uh, anything of a significant threat. Gaddafi applied for further training in England and in 1966 he succeeded in joining the Royal Armored Corps in Dorset. Gaddafi didn't like England. He noted that people who did all the menial jobs were rarely of Anglo-Saxon descent. He felt that, that um, these people were not being treated well in British society. He went around in his Arab robes, slightly arrogantly, and this is Gaddafi sort of showing his um, disdain for British society and, uh, you know, I'm going to be Arab and uh, I'm going to be myself. On June 5th, 1967, the year after Gaddafi had returned to Libya, 
the Arab-Israeli Six-Day War broke out. Gaddafi was sent with a contingent of soldiers to support the Egyptian army, but when he reached the border, the war was over. The Israelis, backed by the West, had squashed the armies of Syria, Jordan, and Egypt. It was a humiliation for the Arab world. We reckon that the plotting for a change of government uh, began at the end of the, the Six Day War. Underground, he spent all his time uh, work for the revolution. He's always busy. Qaddafi was now an officer in King Idris's army. In 1968, the charismatic and handsome soldier managed to marry the daughter of a general. The match was short-lived, but produced a son. Gaddafi was now ready to make his next move. It would be an extremely dangerous one that would change his country forever. In 1969, Muammar Gaddafi, the son of poor Bedouins, was a captain in the Royal Libyan Army. He was also a Muslim idealist inflamed by the ideas of Arab nationalism, and he had plans to change the world. Gaddafi had not only the same sense that many people during that time had of unlimited horizons, but he is fairly considered of a sort of 60s generation. But he was a little older, much more serious, and had far bigger plans than most students. He too defied authority, but his greatest anger was aimed at what he saw as Western imperialism. As an Arab nationalist, he wanted to overthrow the pro-Western Libyan government. We in the embassy were aware of the nationalist feeling, of course. But it was a, a, a period of unease. But I found it very difficult, uh, without any hard evidence, to convince people that uh, things where something was brewing. There was no instability uh, per se, but you know, it, there was a sentiment throughout that time for a change. Very early in the morning on September 1st, 1969, a score of young officers in Tripoli and in Benghazi got ready to bring down the king. If we succeed, it is good. If we fail, it is good because we tried and this our job to do. I was uh, very busy before the coup trying to make sure that something of this kind didn't happen. About five o'clock in the morning, as I was crossing the street back, uh, a posse of troops came around the corner and found me in the middle of this empty road, and so uh, they stuck a gun in my back and said, I said, take me to your officer. And so we marched down the road to the radio and television station and out tumbled a young, good-looking lieutenant. I said to him, uh, who are you? He said, I'm Lieutenant Gaddafi. Who are you? <laughs> Just a few hours later, at 6 a.m., a Sousa march was played on the radio, and at 6.30, Gaddafi went on the air to deliver Communique 1. <laughs> People in Libya quickly realized that the anonymous voice on the radio meant a revolution had taken place. I just woke up one morning and opened the door. I found a soldier in front of the house. <laughs> can't go out. We saw each other after the victory. We are very, very happy very uh, proud. Especially uh, the revolution came without any bloodshed. At a barracks near Benghazi, one government soldier was killed and 15 were wounded. Key members of the old government were arrested, but no one was executed. Many welcomed the coup. Maybe, maybe something would be done to remove the corruption, to remove the, the, uh, the, uh, the nepotism, to remove so, so much of the, of the ills of the society. Telegraph, London, of course, that I thought that this man, Lieutenant Gaddafi, was speaking with sufficient authority to sound like boss. Soon it became clear to the public as well that Gaddafi was the leader of the young officers who called themselves the Revolutionary Command Council. He now ruled Africa's fourth largest country. He was only 27 but knew what he wanted. 
he came with very, very clear goals. Unity, socialism and freedom. The slogans of the Egyptian revolution. He's, he's going to change. He's going to be a modernizer to bring Libya into the, uh, the 20th century, really. These were his goals when he first came to power. The fall of the old government might have been popular, but the Revolutionary Command Council had a rough start. Almost instantly, there were several unsuccessful counter-coups, and soon after the takeover, Gaddafi disappeared for a while. It turned out he was in the hospital, apparently with a case of appendicitis. He was cured, and in the process, fell in love with his nurse, Safiya. They would marry soon after his release. He's a very private individual. We don't know much about his private life. I visited him uh, many times, but I didn't sit there because when we visit him uh, in hospital, uh, he make the visit work. Gaddafi was in a hurry. A devout Muslim, he wasted no time banning alcohol, closing nightclubs, and turning churches into mosques. And he also replaced Roman letters in advertising and street signs with Arabic script. This is a stop sign in Arabic. You can see faintly it also said stop in Latin letters, S-T-O-P. But it's been painted over. All non-Arabic writing has been abolished by the revolution. Then he proceeded to get rid of Westerners on Libyan soil and asked the British and the Americans to evacuate their bases. In June 1970, 3,000 Americans left Wheelis Air Base near Tripoli. Next, he took on the hugely profitable oil companies operating in Libya. Gaddafi wanted a larger share of the income from the country's high-quality oil and threatened to nationalize the companies that didn't meet his demands. The companies would respond, we can't do a deal with you, then uh, you're, you're going to have to drink your oil. Uh, and, uh, and Gaddafi said, if, if I have to stop production because you won't buy it, we'll go back to, to drinking camel milk and dates, and we'll live on that. So he single-handedly launched the oil price explosion uh, of the 1970s. That changed the face of the oil industry because it created a model for other um, producing countries. It also probably emboldened the producing countries for what would be several years later the big oil boycott. The 1973 oil boycott plunged America into an energy crisis. There was no gas at the pumps and suddenly Gaddafi who had given OPEC real teeth, looked like a serious threat to American economic interests. Gaddafi resented uh, the Western policies, and people were really impressed. Here, a young chap with a fluffy hair and, you know, uh, revolutionary and very genuine, uh, speaking his own mind. But what Gaddafi wanted more than anything was Arab unity, and he hoped for Libya to merge with Nasser's Egypt. He led the revolution to liberate Libya, to unity. Libya with Egypt, and Nasser is the, our leader. We uh, have no plan to rule the country. Gaddafi met with his hero Nasser several times to discuss a union between their countries. The novice ruler had big ideas but little knowledge of the world outside Libya. His youth and lack of sophistication showed during a formal dinner in Egypt. He was presented with an official dinner, some shrimps, and uh, he sort of looked, Gaddafi that is, looked askance at, at these shrimps and said he couldn't eat them because they were locusts. Gaddafi, who came from the desert and had never seen a shrimp, was clearly a misfit in the halls of power. His plans to unite with Egypt suffered a huge setback when Nasser suddenly died of a heart attack on September 28, 1970. It was an immense loss not only for the Arab world in general, but for Gaddafi personally. His hero was gone. Only a year after coming to power, the inexperienced leader was left without his mentor and intellectual compass. This actually was a crippling blow to him. Gaddafi never been popular with the other Arab leaders because he realized that uh, most of the Arab leaders are corrupt and they are uh, unpopular when it comes to their own people. Uh, so he wanted to be different. He wanted to be the representative of uh, the Arab masses. He was hugely disappointed when uh, President Sadat uh, took over in Egypt. 
Qaddafi became a more and more outspoken and bitter uh, critic of Sadat, whom he accused of corruption, of thievery, uh, and of being an American puppet. The new Egyptian president, Anwar Sadat, quickly became convinced that Qaddafi was crazy. It was the first rebuff to Qaddafi's lasting hopes for Arab unity. Qaddafi also dreamed of making Libya an example of a modern Arab state. But the poor Bedouin whose determination had won him power would soon discover that taking over the country was a lot easier than running it. Gaddafi had toppled the Libyan government in a coup. He was only in his late 20s and was living modestly for the leader of an oil-rich country. He regularly went back to the desert and still enjoyed the company of simple Bedouins. He lived uh, through the hardship of the desert. He's humble and he's genuine. I believe he really uh, likes to live like his own people, no luxury life. But he was a man with ambitious plans for his country. In the early 1970s, Gaddafi was determined to spend his country's wealth on improving life for Libya's three million people. Most of them still lived in poverty in spite of the windfall from oil. The first four years, you saw fantastic growth in infrastructure, you saw fantastic growth in, in services, you saw fantastic growth in, 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 in the building of homes. He allowed for, for Libyans to experiment, to set up factories, and to set up, I mean, all of a sudden you found factories manned by Libyans, owned by Libyans. He put the oil money into social programs. It was free medicine, free education, free housing, uh, subsidized food. So it was a kind of a socialist welfare state. Certainly Libyans were better off than most citizens in other Arab countries. But Qaddafi also built up a formidable military force, buying a large part of his arsenal from the Soviet Union. Libya seemed to be making progress toward a modern state. Then, in 1973, Qaddafi called for a clean break with the two political systems which dominated the world. You had two, two camps, you know, the American camps and the Soviet camps, and you need some, something in between. So he introduced the third theory, hoping that this will, will be the right choice for the Arab world. He had good intention uh, to his country. It took two years and many long seminars before the first installment of Qaddafi's ideas for the perfect society was published in 1975. Two more volumes followed in 1977 and 1978. They resembled an Islamic green version of Mao's Little Red Book. Gaddafi expected great enthusiasm for his pocket-sized recipe for a better world. There's a kind of restless disappointment and hope that, you know, he will find compatriots in this project to rectify the world. Now, what is a rectified world? I think for him it is profoundly egalitarian. So drawing on his Bedouin experience and Islam, Gaddafi set out to teach the world what true democracy was like. Government was essentially abolished in favor of local people's committees, which would operate according to their own rules. And that was his pronouncement. You're the people's democracy, do it at the grassroots level. So off these different Libyans went doing who knows what. People's revolutionary congresses, local committees, regional committees, you name it, there's a committee for everything. And somehow in, out of this morass of uh, political machinations, some sort of policy is supposed to come out. Gaddafi's specific ideas for society are depicted in a propaganda comic book. He decided that businesses could not have employees, only partners transportation, so everybody got a car. Rentals were forbidden, so everybody had to own their own house. Gaddafi also declared equal rights for women and encouraged them to take jobs outside the home. He allowed them to serve in the army and went as far as employing some of them as his personal bodyguards. And unlike most Muslim leaders, he sometimes took his wife Sophia along on official state visits abroad. He never uh, um, imposed any restrictions on women. He opened all the avenues for them. He's a pioneer in this field. Gaddafi himself would be the first among equals. 
he renounced all titles and was to be known simply as the leader. I am not president, I am not prime minister, I have no government, there is no uh, official regime, political regime in Libya, the authority now is in the hands of the peoples, in the uh, people's conferences. He changed the country's name to the Libyan Arab Jamakiria, which means the state of the masses, and the flag became solid green. It seemed all of Gaddafi's reforms caused chaos and opposition. The Green Book served to, to unsettle things, just turned the, the, the country inside out. You would go to the store and come back and you find somebody in your house. And there's absolutely nothing you can do about it because there's no law to protect you. But all of this social experimentation had the result of helping him to, uh, to stay in power by keeping by keeping potential adversaries off balance. Allahu Akbar! And he had plenty of adversaries. The religious conservatives did not like the leader's attitude to gender questions. Army officers plotted against Gaddafi, and students protested against interference from revolutionary committees. And for the first time under Gaddafi's rule, the response was rough justice. I was coming downtown. Well, actually, I saw two gallows, and then two people were put up there, and they were hung, and they were hung. Businessmen and dissidents left the country. Those disloyal to Gaddafi, he attempted and sometimes succeeded in liquidating. The idealist had become brutal to stay in control. But the Libyan leader still believed that his Green Book version of democracy would be a way for those he considered the oppressed of the world to escape their lot. I am sure that the new generation will uh, adopt the theory of the Green Book. And it is spreading now in this new generation of the world. From the start of his regime, Gaddafi had given money to all kinds of revolutionary groups that were anathema to the American government at the time. Nelson Mandela's African National Congress and the Irish Republican Army. The Sandinistas in Nicaragua, Castro in Cuba, the rebels in Angola, and America's own Louis Farrakhan. That's it for Brother Gaddafi. And he sent troops to neighboring Chad and got involved in the civil war there. He wants to be the, known as the liberator. Every revolutionary group in the global anti-imperialist struggle, call them revolutionaries, terrorists, what you will, came to Tripoli because they could get handouts. But above all, Gaddafi gave money to anyone working to eliminate the state of Israel. Gaddafi had long been a thorn in the side of the West. Personally, President Jimmy Carter felt the prick when Gaddafi clouded his prospects for re-election by hiring the president's wayward brother, Billy Carter, as a business consultant. In 1979, Billy could be seen among people that America considered terrorists, celebrating the 10th anniversary of the revolution. That occasion was another opportunity for Gaddafi to parade his $20 billion arsenal. By now, the Libyan leader looked less like a maverick and a lot more like a menace, one who was rumored to have the atom bomb. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear... But President I... Ronald Reagan, who succeeded Jimmy Carter in 1981, had no patience with Gaddafi and was determined to teach the intractable Libyan leader a lesson. By the early 1980s, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi had been Libya's leader for more than 10 years he was living under heavy protection in the Azizia barracks with his wife, Sophia, and his six children. The family would soon include another daughter, an adopted baby girl named Anna. He'd uh, find the time to uh, be near his uh, children. In my opinion, uh, he's a very uh, good father playing uh, football with uh, his children. He's a normal person. He's very, uh, very friendly. A nice, nice man. Not everyone saw him that way. In 1981, a Newsweek cover proclaimed him to be the most dangerous man in the world. He had been and would be the target of assassination attempts, both by Western and Arab countries. There are innumerable Western and Arab 
uh, financed plots against Libya. The French Foreign Intelligence Service put a bomb in Gaddafi's private jet. There was the uh, British MI6 that tried to kill Gaddafi with a car bomb. So Gaddafi ventured out of the barracks only under heavy protection, though he would occasionally be seen going shopping for clothes in Tripoli. Yeah, he was a lot of you, I think. He used to dress up in these elaborate costumes. And, you know, there was Gaddafi, the, the sort of, in his naval uniform, Gaddafi in his Air Force uniform and that kind of thing. Gaddafi may have liked fancy outfits, as these Libyan stamps show, but it was not his reputation as a clothes horse that many Libyans objected to by the beginning of the 1980s. They didn't like what the country had turned into as a result of Gaddafi's Green Book reforms. A very bleak place with no stores and few people on the streets, and no free enterprise, everything run by the state. There aren't secret policemen on every corner, but there's so much informing that goes on. That's the kind of uh, sort of virtual terror that they have there. It's an unseen terror. He ushered in what Libyans came to call decade of desperation. Because during that decade, Libyans really, really, really hurt. And he turned against the Americans. He turned against the Europeans by supporting a host, God knows, a host of movements around the globe that some didn't be called terrorists, others might not be called terrorist organizations. Terrorist clients were a drain on Libyan resources. And then in 1982, a long-lasting worldwide oil glut began to reduce Libya's income sharply. So people started saying, you know, it's one thing if we have excess revenues that we can support terrorists and revolutionary groups around the world, but if we are actually belt tightening, then that money should not be supporting other people, it should be supporting us. But his support for revolutions everywhere continued. So when bombs went off in the airports of Rome and Vienna in December of 1985, the Reagan administration quickly pointed to Gaddafi. Whether or not Gaddafi was guilty of the crime, Reagan quickly responded with sanctions on Libya. Outrages against civilized conduct are, of course, as infamous as those of the Ayatollah Khomeini. See, Reagan is liar. Gaddafi, in turn, accused Reagan of repeatedly violating Libya's self-proclaimed territory, the Gulf of Sidra. In 1981, the U.S. shot down two defending Libyan fighters. Good kill, good kill! And in 1986, the Sixth Fleet crossed what Gaddafi called the line of death. Gaddafi was very important as a symbol to Reagan. And Reagan understood world theater and understood that you could use someone like Gaddafi to exemplify everything that was awful in the world. And Gaddafi, in turn, enjoyed that role. And he played it to the hilt on American TV. We are a victim. Aggression comes from uh, one side, from America. The America is threatening us by its uh, secret fleet. One day we may launch a war against this fleet, never mind if America destroyed us uh, completely and uh, used all its nuclear weapons against us. It is a glorious battle. Then on April 5th, 1986, a bomb exploded in the LaBelle nightclub in Berlin. Sergeant Kenneth Ford and a young Turkish woman were killed and 230 others were wounded. This monstrous brutality is but the latest act in Colonel Gaddafi's reign of terror. The evidence is now conclusive that the terrorist bombing of La Belle Discotheque was planned and executed under the direct orders of the Libyan regime. The Europeans were skeptical about Gaddafi's involvement, but America, with British help, immediately prepared for a military strike against Libya. Gaddafi, suspecting nothing, had spent time with his wife, held meetings, and retired late. Shortly before 2 a.m. on April 15, 1986, about 100 American Air Force and Navy bombers swooped in from the sea and roared over Benghazi and Tripoli. The city lights were on and no sirens sounded an alert. No one was prepared. The U.S. raid on Tripoli took 11 minutes. At least 40 Libyans were killed and 93 were wounded. There was heavy damage in a suburb of Tripoli and also at the Azizia barracks where the Gaddafi family lived. Immediately I rent the uh, headquarters in Tripoli. 
I found uh, no reply. I became anxious. Two of Gaddafi's sons were wounded, and his adopted daughter, Hannah, was killed. In her grief, Safiya Gaddafi made a very rare public appearance to excoriate the Americans. It was a very, uh, very sad uh, situation. The main target of the American bombing was unscathed, but no one knew where he was. Later, he personally showed Eric Margulies the damage to his home. He took me by the hand, so Gaddafi and I were walking through the darkness, hand in hand, Gaddafi with a flashlight. There were rafters that had fallen down on the floor and broken masonry and smashed furniture. And you could still smell the, the smell of the explosives and burning. Uh, it was devastating for him. Uh, and he expected uh, a reaction all over the world. But he was shocked to see that he was alone. He was bombed. He was punished. He was chosen because he's the... Uh, uh, the weakest link in the Middle East. I have no illusion that tonight's action will ring down the curtain on Gaddafi's reign of terror. But we will persevere. Two days after the raid, Gaddafi re-emerged on Libyan television to celebrate the downing of a single American bomber. Libya, he said, had won a great victory. So henceforth, the country would be known not as the Libyan Jamahiriya, but as the Great Libyan Jamahiriya. If Gaddafi managed to snatch a semblance of victory out of the jaws of a terrible defeat, another tragic event would soon make his life even more difficult. Muammar Gaddafi had incurred the enmity of the West because of his support of terrorists. And in 1986, he survived a punitive American bombing raid on Libya. Humiliated, he now kept a low profile in international politics. He was quieter after that. He, he was not involved in other direct attacks on the United States and Americans, American assets, uh, for quite a long time. But on December 21st, 1988, Pan Am Flight 103, on its way from Frankfurt to New York, exploded over Lockerbie, Scotland. In that tragedy, 259 people on board and 11 people on the ground were killed. Two-thirds of the victims were Americans. No one survived. Investigators combed the wreckage of the plane and determined that a bomb in the luggage compartment had caused the explosion. Instantly, Libya was suspected. I believe that he ordered the attack on Pan Am 103 as a reprisal uh, vengeance for the attack on Tripoli and Benghazi in 1986. He sees this as simply unconventional warfare. After a lengthy investigation of the Lockerbie disaster, two Libyans were indicted, but Gaddafi refused to turn over the suspects for trial in Scotland. So in 1992, the United Nations imposed complete sanctions on Libya, cutting it off from the rest of the world. It took several years before a compromise was worked out, and Gaddafi handed over the suspects for trial on neutral ground in Holland. In 2001, more than a decade after the explosion, one of the suspects was found guilty and the other was acquitted. But there are lingering questions about the Lockerbie disaster. I think that the story of Lockerbie is yet to be entirely told. Um, I think there's, there's suspicion in many circles that this was not just a Libyan affair. The UN sanctions were lifted, but the United States continues its embargo on Libya. The sanctions, combined with Libya's inefficient centralized economy, have caused high inflation, shortages, and general hardship for the Libyan people. But they also may have subdued Gaddafi for a while. He definitely is not revolutionary as he used to be. He changed a lot. Uh, he is adopting uh, the free market policies, and he is trying to actually push Libya ahead and to catch up with, with the international economy, international community. He believes uh, Africa is, you know, his new uh, ground now and uh, would like to make um, African people and African nations much better. The old fire-breathing Gaddafi is sort of uh, cooling down and he's now becoming more of a, a, a regional revolutionary. And in fact, I think he's on a new trend where he really is, 
is going to have to accommodate himself finally to the realities of the world. He has even softened his stance on Israel. He made a startling proposal at a recent Arab summit conference. He said, look, you know, we can't fight Israel. We, we can't defeat Israel. So let us establish a relation with Israel. Why, why Israel shouldn't be part of the Arab League, for example, a member of the Arab League? Yeah, so uh, this is Gaddafi. This uh, shows how much he changed uh, because of sanction and uh, because of also experience and because of age. Gaddafi is getting on in years. His children are grown, and there is speculation as to his successor. Most likely, it is his oldest son, Mohammed. But some people wouldn't be surprised if Gaddafi were grooming his daughter, Aisha, to be the first female head of state in the Arab world. Recently, she made an official visit to Iraq's Saddam Hussein. The sons give every indication of having been spoiled. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if his daughter was the most competent member of that generation. Gaddafi still leads Libya, but his ambitions may have diminished as his many failures loom over him. There is no Arab unity, no Palestinian state, no acceptance of his Green Book philosophy outside Libya, and Libya is no egalitarian paradise. He seems to be looking beyond politics now and has turned to writing pensive essays. His first collection is called Escape to Hell. In it, he lashes out against modern cities, Muslim fundamentalists, and selected Arab leaders. Gaddafi remains the unrepentant Bedouin who goes his own way. I think if there's one single feature of his psyche, in a sense, that is reflected in everything he's done, it is a kind of rebellion. It is a, a suspicion of stability, um, a suspicion of hierarchy and authority. He is a modern, leading-edge Bedouin. In fact, he is an eccentric. And maybe he's a little bit touched, as they say. But you have to be crazy like a fox to stay in power for over 30 years in the Mideast when there are at least seven or eight countries who are trying to kill you. People may think he's crazy, but better to be a villain than a nobody.